And that was kind of the gateway. That was that was the you know aha moment. Welcome to this new podcast. Uh, today, I welcome a guest uh, that I admire a lot for his database uh, skills. Live from Chicagool, ladies and gentlemen, Nicolas Rougeau. Good hey morning, uh, Nick, and welcome uh, to the show. So we have been a guest uh, before. And um, well, looking at your amazing work on DataVis, what we said together was uh, we need to do some shorter videos to explain a little bit uh, your inspiration and some of the particular uh, works that you have been uh, doing. And there, here we are. So the first uh, video of the series uh, will be dedicated to uh, one of your older uh, work, which is called Of The Stuff. Uh, could you explain us uh, a little bit what is uh, actually Of The Stuff? And I'm going to show a video while you are talking. All right. Uh, Off the Staff is essentially an experiment in uh, visualizing classical music, <clears throat> uh, imagining if classical music is turned into data. So if all of the notes in classical music are, are turned into individual data points, all each having a, a pitch, a time when they occurred, and the length of their note, uh, Off the Staff is visualizing how that would appear if you plotted them all on one circular chart. So that's what we're seeing right now. So we have uh, circles which are bigger. We also have uh, um, a different position for each uh, dot. Uh, what does actually the, the position to the center represent? Right, so the distance from the center represents the, uh, the octave or the, the pitch essentially of the note. Uh, the size of the circle is the note for how, how long, the duration of the note essentially. And then the color also represents the instrument that was played for that note. Uh, so I wanted, I really wanted to find a way to put, to visualize all of the music in a score in one snapshot. So it's all in one view, rather than seeing sheets of sheet music lined up, you know, what would it look like if it was all in one view? And I created animations to show this as well, so that by the time you're finished watching the whole thing, you kind of watch the painter, the, the, the picture get painted in front of you. And by the end, you have a full and comprehensive uh, view of the music and you kind of get a sense of, you know, oh, you remember that part or remember that part or what made the, you know, all those little dots appear next to each other or the bigger dots or the, large, or the smaller dots. Do you remember actually uh, where uh, the ID for uh, of the stuff uh, come from? Um, it's, it's a little bit hard to explain. I think, you know, when I was just, you know, sur surfing around, uh, I, I stumbled upon some experimental music notations from, you know, centuries gone by. And I thought, well, that'd be kind of interesting to play around with. And I should preface this by saying, I can't read sheet music at all. <laughs> uh, my tagline for the project is I can't read music, but I can parse it. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to try to get the data or extract data from sheet music? And that led me down many different paths. And, and that was the start of this. Did you see uh, that project at uh, the beginning like a, a personal challenge? Um, well, if something gets stuck in my head, it, it just kind of stays there until I figure it out. So it was kind of a personal challenge, yeah. So uh, in terms of technical challenge now, um, what are the different steps you had to uh, go through to realize that, uh, that project? Obviously, you had first to choose the music. Yes, and the reason I chose classical music is because it was by and large, copyright free. <laughs> so I wouldn't I don't have to worry about, you know, copyright infringement and, and, you know, talented artists knocking on my door saying, hey, you can't do that with our music. Uh, but also uh, classical music, there's plenty of it in, in sheet music form. And so, you know, the supply was abundant. It was more just, you know, what pieces do I know of and, you know, which ones might be fun to visualize. Uh, the one we see playing on the screen here is uh, Neptune from Gustav Holst's The Planets. Um, and it's I think it's, it's like a, a six minute part, but there's seven movements in the in the in the whole uh, score um, and each one has their own colorful motif. So in terms of the challenges, the, 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 the big challenge for me was first just trying to figure out how to read sheet music, <laughs> not something somebody can learn, you know, overnight. But I, I, I kind of gave myself a crash course looking through Wikipedia, YouTube videos, just trying to figure out, you know, what all these things are. Um, and it's a little bit ironic because I grew up in a very musical household. So my parents could read sheet music, but I certainly can't. It never clicked with me. 
Um, but the challenge was, aside from learning what all the different notes are and the symbols are, was how do I get the data from sheet music into a parsable format? You know, all sheet music typically is PDFs you can find online or scan documents or something. So the big challenge was how do I get it from there to, to you know. So how, how did you do it? Uh, so I did that, but well, first I was doing it manually. Every note, one at a time, <laughs> using cheat sheet references, saying, okay, that's an A, that's a B, that's a C. But obviously that that was <laughs> not, not, not very efficient. Uh, and then I just, by sheer chance, by trying to figure out if there are, you know, apps for managing, for creating sheet music, I found one called MuseScore. Um, and I was thrilled to see that it was free, uh, free to use. And so what it does is it allows people to generate sheet music. And, but it also exports the music in a variety of formats, one of which is MIDI. And that was kind of the gateway. That was that was the you know aha moment where okay I can I can import sheet music that people have created classical music that people have reproduced in modern sheet music format released under public domain, export it as MIDI, and then I can use that to convert it to either XML or CSV or what have you. And once I can get it into that format, then it's parsable. Then then it's in my world. You know, it's no longer in the in the music world that I can't read. Now I'm just looking at you know numbers and, and, and octaves and pitches and stuff. And I can do something with that. So that was, that's what that took. Yeah, listening to the video, however, we, we really know that it is a MIDI file. So yes. isn't there isn't there some uh, kind of loss in the terms of the quality of the music of the deepness of the music, uh, the variations, when you convert um, a classical piece of music into MIDI? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the, the drawback to this is that, you know, I, I upload all these videos on my YouTube channel with the, the audio playing in the background as you watch it. But obviously it's synthesized music. It's not, it doesn't have that human touch of somebody actually playing an oboe or a violin or a cello or something. It is synthesized. It's music exported directly from MuseScore. And that has a nice, a good musical selection to choose from. And I, I found some libraries that makes it sound as realistic as I could. But obviously, it's not going to match, you know, the, the the real life thing. So I think, I think that was a fair trade off, though, because it's still this project isn't necessarily hearing about he, about hearing beautiful music. It's more visualizing it. The music is almost secondary to the the, the visuals, really. So let's talk about uh, the visualization uh, part. Um, so once you have that um, that MIDI thing, um, and that you are able to to convert it to uh, to data. Um, how did you decide what kind of visualization you wanted to uh, to do? Uh, so I went through a lot of different trials and errors to figure out what works best. I think I went through 20 different versions. Um, and I do this for all my projects. I like to save the previous versions because you never know when you're going to find you know inspiration from an old project or just an old version of a project. So I would save these visualizations, save these versions, and I'd post a couple of them on Twitter to see if any, see if they, they clicked with anybody. Um, and some of, them, some of them were really kind of interesting. I thought, I thought they were interesting, you know, visualizing maybe each individual uh, measure has its own little world of, of, of notes, um, but they still felt, they didn't feel very comprehensive. They felt a little bit, you know, difficult to, to grasp. They were, they just weren't clicking with me. And so <laughs> I did almost the easiest thing that I should have started with was put it on a circle. You know, everything, everything typically looks better in circles. Um, and so once I got that idea of, you know, you know going around clockwise and, and plotting the whole thing out, I realized any of them would fit. Any score will fit on a circle because it's a circle. You know, you can plot as much data as you want on there. Um, and once I once I did a few experiments with that, I realized, yep, th this is the way. This this this, this is uh, this is the way it should work. <laughs> yeah, and it's very clever because it also enables you to um, uh, to compare different pieces of music yeah. uh, together, see yeah. the different movements, and uh, well, th there is a lot of uh, a lot of dimensions to explore in your visualization. Not only there is the color, there is the size, there is the the position, there is the tempo. So there are at least four dimensions that make that visualization really uh, really amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I was I was like continually excited about this project because I had no idea what everyone every piece was going to look like. You have no idea. I mean, you can look at the sheet music and get a sense of you know the high notes and the low notes, but until I saw it plotted for the first time, it was a mystery. And every time I saw the first one, 
I was surprised. I was I was just amazed. I thought this I didn't expect that, but I love it. Let's let's go on to the next one, you know. <laughs> So from a scale to from from zero to ten in terms of difficulty, how would you rate that project? Um, wow, that would be that's a difficult question. I don't know. Parts of it were easy and parts of it were very difficult. Uh, animating it was the hardest part. So I would say uh, an eight or a nine uh, because I'm not a coder. So you know, if I was a talented coder, I'm sure it'd probably be a two or a three. But um, the difficulty is what made it all that more rewarding. Absolutely, well. absolutely. Would you yeah. make it again? Oh, yeah. And I have. I've made many of them. <laughs> I even revisited the project after about a year to, to improve the process and the workflow. Thanks to the creators of MuseScore, I contacted them and they were great, gracious enough to help me write a little bit of code to get that conversion from MIDI to CSV so that I didn't have to do so many steps and that it made it a lot easier. So thank you so much for going through uh, this amazing work. And uh, so I remember your website is c82.net. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can come back to see other videos where Nick will explain other types of visualization. Have a very nice day, Nick. Thank you for having me.